Wow, we're listening to the closing statements uh, in the Tex MacGyver case. My name is Bob Bianchi. I'm guest hosting for the first time, so uh, give me a break what you see. Hopefully, uh, we're going to have a, a great show, and, and I think this is riveting. And we have uh, Linda Kenny Bodden with us, who is an extraordinarily experienced, not only assistant prosecutor like myself, a criminal right. defense attorney. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's only my second time being here, so we're novices. So we're novices, so but we're not necessarily in the courtroom, right, right. Linda? No, not in the courtroom. Both of us have tried a number of cases. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, you know um, I've been watching the viewers when I've been doing the commentary on this, and I, I want to talk a little bit about summations, uh, and because obviously me and you could talk about how do you prepare a summation and, and what's going through your head mentally. When I was the chief county prosecutor, mm -hmm. I found that there were some assistant prosecutors that were really great at doing these things and some that weren't. Right. Um, some just had a natural skill set to it. But, you know, I'm curious about this thought that one of my mentors taught me that I always followed, is that you should be preparing your summation from the day you get your file. What do you think about well, that? Well, you do, in the sense that you have themes that you're going to start at the beginning of the trial when you have an opening to the closing. Because the theme that you really want to do as a lawyer, you want to tell the jury what you're going to tell tell them you want to tell the jury what you're telling them and then you want to tell the jury what you told them so that they understand where you're coming from when your themes and your points and the most important part of summation for me Bob is that you have to give the jurors in there who you believe are your jurors the ammunition the arguments to argue with other jurors who may not be your jurors you want to give them the points the law the the facts so they can go into that jury room and they can say well you know miss Kenny Bodden or mr. Bianchi said this and and you know let's talk about that because that's they become you in that jury room and it's very important to keep it simple keep it thematic uh, but keep it over and over again repetition you know I, and, I, and I agree with that and I used to say to my investigators when we were actually investigating a case and getting ready to make an arrest uh, I found this with the law enforcement community a lot of times they were happy when they put the handcuffs on right. somebody because they got the person <laughs> right, I, but right. it was the lawyers that were there and, and that's understandably their role but the lawyers that were there to say hey we got to get the ball over the goal line we got to make sure that that's we right. get out of involuntary manslaughter like the Tex MacGyver case or passion provocation in a case and so I've always tr constructed my case as to what do I want to be saying at the end of the case and then backfilling in yeah, right. getting those facts and getting those witnesses to do that so I agree that preparation in the beginning of the case is key for your summation and one last point I want to ask right. you Linda when we talk about this and you kind of touched upon this I believe more so than any participant in that courtroom the credibility of the prosecutor to deliver in what they said in the opening statement is key in terms of how the jury views them in terms of whether they trust them what are your thoughts on that the best thing you can do is to get a transcript of the prosecution opening statement and then when they said they were going to prove X Y and Z and they didn't or the testimony came out differently you kind of ram it down their throats he told you now we know it's not evidence but he told you he was going to prove that and the reason why he told you he was going to prove that is important because he needs to prove that to do this to get this conviction he or she did not do that so I always get the transcript of what the prosecutor said. Right, because you're not only putting a stake through the facts of the prosecution's case, but through the prosecutor themselves. That's right. And, you know, as a prosecutor, you don't ever want to leave yourself to that vulnerability, and you want to make sure, and I used to say, I know it's bold, but I would be in my opening statements as a, a homicide prosecutor and saying, even though what I say to you and the judge will tell you is not evidence, right. I'm telling you to hold me accountable to these facts I'm saying in the opening statement. And if I fail to deliver on those facts, then you should should hold it against me because what I'm about to tell you here today is exactly what the evidence is going to prove. It's bold because, but of course, I'm only making sure but it's evidence that I absolutely that's know it. I can prove. That's if you know you can absolutely prove it and you know how your witnesses are going to come out because you have prepared your witnesses and there's nothing wrong with meeting with your witnesses and going through their, their examination. Some lawyers, you know, are like, I don't want to taint the witness and what they say. You have to prepare. It's not tainting. It's called preparation. It's like a doctor going into an operating room. You are the producer of a trial. You really are when you're the prosecutor or defense attorney from your, your point of view. And you better have that preparation. Yeah, and to add to that, I can tell you cases that I've had as a prosecutor 
because of the interviewing process that I did behind the scenes, which, by the way, the judge would tell the jurors there's nothing inappropriate That's right. with doing. That's right. I actually, as a prosecutor, have found out information that was exculpatory or favorable to the defense that changed the entire trajectory of the case. Because as prosecutors, Linda, we're, our job is not to just get That's convictions. Right. Our job is to seek justice. And if, unlike the defense, who is there solely to represent their client, if I'm finding something that I believe should be turned over to the defense mm -hmm. and changes the trajectory of the case, then, in general, justice wins out. What do you think about that? You know, that? Bob, like you, when I was a prosecutor, I had an open file. Everyone come and look at my file, yep. whether it was for the case, whether it was for the uh, the relief after the case, the habeas relief. Just here it is. I don't understand these prosecutors who hide evidence. It really doesn't do anyone any good. Because if you're a prosecutor, you hide exculpatory evidence, and the real bad guy is out there doing another crime. And if, you're, if you don't prepare your case, then you're doing a disservice to the people you represent, which is the people of the state that you are a prosecutor. Yeah, I, I tell you, one thing that was shocking to me when I was a young assistant prosecutor, I was in that office for seven years and I went out and did defense work. Um, there were a number, Linda, of, of cases that I handled that I exposed prosecutors withholding significant yeah. exculpatory evidence, even up to and including videotapes that exonerated the defendant. And something I was a little surprised about when it came to the attention of the court, while the case got dismissed, nobody ever really did anything with regard right. to the prosecutor. Yeah, no one ever, never one ever follows suit with regard to the prosecutor when that happens. I remember the hardest thing for me was dismissing a case where the labs didn't show that the person who was accused of a rape was a rapist, that we had arrested. And, you know, the, the police don't like you, other people don't like you that are dealing with this, but you have to do your job. And if you have to take the heat because you're doing a job, you just do it. Right, right. And I, I think, listen, our job, again, is to make sure we get to the right space. When I became the head prosecutor, I'm going to tell you another thing that's interesting to me uh, and, and see what you think. Well, I was a little disturbed at the idea that some defense attorneys had cases and they never presented to us in the beginning of the case mitigation information right, or investigative right. information or even, and I think the viewers would be interested in knowing this, a lot of what we do as prosecutors and defense attorneys isn't necessarily saying he didn't do it. We're either saying he's guilty of something less right. or that he did it or she did it, but there's a good part of that person's life where we can show mercy and compassion, and yet sometimes we didn't find out until after a person went to state prison when you would just coincidentally meet the defense lawyer. They tell you all this stuff and you'd ask, why didn't you tell me all that from the beginning? That's right. Everyone wants to be on a team, right? And I've had cases that people always ask, so as a defense attorney now, how can you represent that guilty person? Well, most people that I try cases with, I don't think they're guilty, or they're not guilty of the count, that the top count they're charged with. And so you have to try to present that mitigation. You have to, you're not dealing strategy. You're not giving away a strategy. But if you have somebody that you know has, has a, a mental uh, defect, in terms of the psychiatric manuals, you want to go to that prosecutor. You want to try to show that maybe you should take the plea to manslaughter right now instead of the murder plea, because this is really a travesty uh, trying this person and putting them to the top count. That reminds me a lot of doing death penalty work, where after Very you're important. in the penalty phase and the defense is allowed to bring out all sorts of sympathetic evidence, yes, right. it's also humanizing the client. And, and despite the fact that in those cases, every single juror says they could impose the death penalty after they sit there and they listen to the horrible things that typically have happened in the lives of those people, they actually may find that that decision is very hard. And I think the same thing applies in a non-death penalty case in order to position your client well. So let's go to Tex MacGyver. Right. Do you think that because of these varying statements that he gave and getting the publicist, that somehow this tweaked the prosecutor who has tremendous discretion mm -hmm to ch actually change, to look at him in a bad light, and actually move those charges from involuntary manslaughter to murder. Do you think that came into no, play? No, actually, what I think happened here is that because he gave the different statements, the prosecution probably said, aha, we could use the fact he gave the different statements to get a conviction here. Uh, whether we get the conviction on the involuntary manslaughter, we get the conviction on a felony murder, which is really, a, you know, was a, was a really weak charge in terms of the way this is played here, or on the murder case. Uh, really, I think that's what's going on here. Okay. Well, listen, I mean, we're going to go back to court because they're in session, and uh, we look forward to your further Thank commentary, you. and here we go. Wow, you've just got done listening to the rebuttal closing statement of the prosecutor in this case, and I'm with Linda Kenny Bodden, 
uh, an experienced both uh, criminal defense attorney and civil litigator um, and uh, prosecutor, rather. She's handled cases in Hernandez case and um, the basketball player, I'm forgetting his Jason name, Williams. Jason Williams. I mean, so you've been around the block, and I love being on with a real like pro like you. Because we were talking, man, we were writing yeah. notes left and right. I got to start with, I, I, I just have to say this. Uh, Whatever you think of what the defense has done in this case, I started, I, I, there was octopuses, <laughs> there, there were animals, there was, uh, a, there jar was a, of sand. a jar. Now, when we get to the jar, folks, I don't want you guys to be confused here. This is not the Copperfield part of what Law and Crime Network is doing. This is the Tex MacGyver case. First, the jar was clear, then it was cloudy. Hey, listen. I'm a fan of props and demonstrable evidence in front of a jury if it is proving a fact. Otherwise, personally, I believe, Linda, that it could look kind of cheesy and kind of look like that's all you got. What are your thoughts? Well, it certainly looked cheesy. I mean, this jar, I'm going to, can I borrow this? This, <laughs> jar, this coffee cup is empty. Well, there's a prop. So is the prosecution's case for murder. It's empty. Oh, oh and it go. just spilled Oh, and up. magically, there's but liquid magically, coming out of it. Is, and this is what happens with things like this when you start using props, okay? Also, where you and I practiced, Bob, in New Jersey, where we had our main licenses and where we both were prosecutors, we would probably be before an ethics committee if we argued that the defense made it kind of gray and put sand in an argument or brought out an octopus, an octopus tape. This is a murder trial where somebody has died and somebody could go to jail for the rest of his life. You don't play with props. Yeah. You don't play with, you don't make fun of it. Yeah, and I, and I think even that big picture of the victim, there's just something about it, at least to me, uh, it doesn't come off good, but but that's that's certainly not inappropriate. That's but to right. get to your other point, you are right. In the state of New Jersey, and in most states that I'm aware of, um, they would not allow this. Especially analogies to the defense clouding the waters. Absolutely. You're never allowed to impinge the defense attorney doing their job. But interestingly, Linda, I'm I'm thinking strategically. You didn't hear any objections by the defense to it. Right. Why do you think that is? And we were saying object, 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 and then we both looked at each other and said, aha, because. Because it's so ridiculous of what they were doing that the defense is, it, it, I don't know if they go afterwards again and have any other arguments, but certainly they're going to say, let the jury think, well, where's the evidence? They had to talk about, we could talk about all this kind of other stuff, but maybe we should let them, we should let them talk, ladies and gentlemen, I'm thinking to myself as a defense attorney, because it's so cheesy, yeah. so ridiculous. Yeah. And again, just like that, it spilled all over the argument. Well, that gets back to what my mentors trained me. My dad, who was an excellent traveler, we were just talking about right. him, 86 years old. He's still trying cases. Ooh. amazing. But that always would em emphasize the message as a trial lawyer. It's about what the jury thinks at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. It's not about how smart you are. It's not about that you went to law school. How many erudite lawyers do we see that want to impress everybody that they're smart, alienate the jury? And to get to the Maya Angelou quote, it's not what you say. It's not what you do. It's how you make them feel that's important. Do you agree with that? Yeah, that? Absolutely right. They have to feel that you have proven the case, if you're the prosecutor, beyond a reasonable doubt. If you're the defense attorney, you want just the reverse to happen. So it's not whether they like you. Of course, liking you is also good. But it's not whether they, it's whether they really believe in what you're telling them. Your credibility as a trial lawyer is the most important thing you have in that well. Not how clever you are, not whether you can have a video and spend the taxpayer's money getting a video off YouTube or whatever of an octopus. That doesn't go that way. Yeah, well, we're going to have a lot of talk about some nuances here. But I agree with you completely. And back in the day when I started trying cases uh, plus 25, 28 years ago, you were never allowed to speak to jurors. It was a sacrosanct thing. The media didn't get to them. Right. The lawyers didn't get to them. And you always wondered as a trial lawyer, after you tried the case and after these lawyers here, what's going on inside of that jury right. room? <laughs> You're trying to read every nuance, how they right. look when they come out. But one, one thing that was interesting to me is that just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it as far as the objection is concerned. That's right. And I happen to agree that they may have been saying, hey, this just makes them look like they've got no real facts to argue here. Another thing that I've taken away now that we're allowed to talk to jurors if they approach you, which I still have that discomfort in my mind speaking to them. I know. But I have heard many, many times jurors say, you know, we weren't really sure about this or sure about that, but we really believed in you. You. And right. if you believed in it, we believed you were honest, you were ethical, you were straightforward. We we were very persuaded by your belief in the case. Have you ever experienced that? A absolutely. And I've heard many stories uh, about uh, jurors coming to my colleagues and then telling them 
because we thought you were honest and credible, when there was that little bit of we're not sure which way to go, we went on your favor because of your credibility. So you never lie to a jury, never, ever lie to a jury, ever. Right, and I think that it also the same holds true with regard to, of course, facts control a case, supposedly, right? At least we would hope so. And the presentation is very important. But let's look at this case in its bottom granular piece in my mind. To me, this case came down for the prosecution based on ballistics and based upon motive. That is the financial motive in the case. And I found, and I'm interested to see what your opinion about this, two statements that the prosecutor made that I was really shocked at. Now, we're analyzing this under a microscope. That's right, without being in the jury Without room. being in there, and, and, right. and God knows, you know, we're armed court uh, right, chair quarterbacks right. right now. But I found this compelling. Let's go first to the ballistics aspect of this okay. case. Well, first of all, we have a battle of experts who disagree. I know as a prosecutor, having tried many homicide cases that involve ballistics, and I know that you know this too, it is very difficult for an expert to tell you with exactitude about how a weapon went off, what the angle was, especially in a moving vehicle. What do you think that, about that's that? That's right. And, and how the position was, was, was the decedent, was she looking out the window of the car, was she just turned this way? No matter what you remember, if you just woke up from your sleep, how the gun is, how you're handling it, we, all we know is the angle that the, that, that bullet went through that car back seat and into Diane. That's all you know. You don't know exactly how people were positioned, you know, where their head were, where their arms were. You just don't know that, especially in this type of case. And here, you know, there's a witness here. I know the prosecutor was talking a lot about, well, he, he, he was getting rid of the evidence. He washed off the GSR, the gunshot residue on his hands and all that kind of stuff. There's a witness to the shooting. They brought her to the hospital and he said he shot her. All that is irrelevant in this case. It's simply not, doesn't push that ball forward to say, did the prosecution prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt? Right. So well, let's go back to that ballistics thing for a minute. Right. Something that I found to be very compelling in, in, in a statement, and I want to show the audience a clip of this because I think it's really, to me, the pivotal moment. And and it, just, folks, when, when we're trying cases, and if, you, if you're a skilled trial lawyer, right. we do a technique called looping, or at least you should be. I train it all the time. Take your most important piece of evidence that you have, the wow factor in the case, and find a way to repeat it and get it over in front of the jury over and over, and over, over again. again. In fact, I'll tell you guys a funny story. I was trying a murder case with a, a, as a prosecutor with a co-attorney in my case, and the victim in that case had, uh, had indicated, or the defendant rather, had indicated just before he killed his pregnant wife by lighting her on fire Ooh. that if you don't think I'm going to do it, you got another thing coming to you. Now, my trial partner was doing the summation, and I said to him, if you don't get that out at least five times in your summation, least, I'm right. going to be agitated. And it should Bob, be on the PowerPoint next I, to you, He right. said, I'll get it out. Ten, right. Well, we didn't have PowerPoint back then, but okay. he said, I'll, I'll, I'll get it out ten times. He got it out about seven. I had little hash marks on my little pad. He saw what I was doing, marketing it, right. and I know he was getting towards the end of the summation, and, he, and I was kind of looking at him quizzically like, you're not going to get the ten. And at the end of it, he said, ladies and gentlemen, Drew, if there's one last thing I can say is, if you don't think I'm going to do it, Lois, you got another thing coming. If you don't think I'm going to do it, Lois, you got another thing coming. If you don't think I, he did it three times in a row to get to the tent to satisfy the fact that he had me. Before. But tell again, the jury, right? Tell the jury what you're going to tell them. Tell them what you tell them, and tell them again. You got to keep that loop. You got to keep that in. And you can't be obnoxious or, or be afraid of being obnoxious with it. So here's what I found confounding in something that the prosecutor said in rebuttal, and I like uh, some of our folks online have been asking some questions. Right. That we're going to get to because some of them have been really insightful. But the guy said, and to me, this was the pivotal moment in the trial. Remember, folks, we're talking about, but their case is based on ballistic evidence, and that re means that means they're expert, and it's being based on motive. Let's go to the ballistics. The prosecutor says, "Guns just don't go off." That's what he just said. You heard that, I Linda, heard it, right? right? Absolutely. Well, we're going to show you a clip of what I believe to have been the most powerful moment in the case that I think is the defense lawyer, I would have been saying at least 10 or 20 times. So we'll take a look at that clip and we'll be back Watch to you it, shortly. Great. Remember the expert? Remember the expert from the crime lab? Remember him demonstrating um, the weapon and pulling the trigger when he testified right here? If the gun is in single action, so the hammer cause, it's prime, it's ready to be fired. 
the only way that the, the gun would fire is if the trigger is pulled and then held to the rear long enough for the hammer to fall. So if you were to pull the trigger, but then release the trigger, and I'll put my finger here so that you, I could feel it if it went through, it doesn't touch because you notice the trigger Wow, man, this is the kind of thing that gives you chills in a courtroom when you've been involved with something like this. We've been talking to Linda about, about this, and, and in fact, uh, before we, we get to that, we got Vincent Hill, who's also, and we're going to probably do a three-screen here, uh, a law enforcement expert that's on with us. Welcome to the show, Vincent. How are you? Hey, I'm great. Great to be here. I'm in the courtroom, actually, and we just broke for lunch. So, you know, really interested to get back in the courtroom to see what happens here in court. Hey, Vincent, while we're on this thing about the, I, I, it's been my argument with Linda and actually what had happened during the course of the trial that when you're in a case that you're trying to argue, the prosecution is trying to argue that this was a purposeful murder as opposed to an accident. And when they don't know whether or not a, the, the gun was in single action or double action, and the state's very own expert when handling the weapon on the stand accidentally pulls the trigger. How did that play off in the closing statements? How good a job did the defense do with that piece of uh, information? Well, I thought Don Samuel did an excellent job, not with only that, but with everything he presented during his closing argument. But that was a big oops moment for, you know, the prosecution, but an aha for the defense and the fact that, yeah, this was your argument, but look, it actually played in our favor. It reminded me of something back in 1995 when someone tried to put a glove on and it backfired, you know, for the prosecution. So that's exactly what happened here in court today. You, you know, Vincent, I, I, I can think of so many cases that I tried where little things like this backfired, and that's why, uh, you know, if it, if it doesn't fit, you, you must have quit. You must have uh, quit. Yeah, I mean, I, how many times a prosecutor, I've had a piece of evidence, like a jacket or a ch uh, or clothing, and it's laying on that counsel table, and you're, like, looking at the defendant, and you're looking at the clothing, and you're wondering to yourself, would this fit? Because if it does, it's great, but if it doesn't, it's another OJ, right? Absolutely, and that's exactly the expression the jurors had on their faces today when that was played in the courtroom during those closing arguments. So you believed when you were looking at the jury that when they were seeing that video, which was very well presented by the defense, you believe the jury was really, re it was resonating with the jury. Yeah, absolutely. I think it sunk in, you know, quite clear, you know, that yes, this could have ha happened accidentally. You know, not only that moment, but there were several moments where I watched a jury's expression and it was quite clear what they were thinking. You know, I don't want to speculate, but I think it was quite clear what they were thinking here. Is yeah, it, 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 I just want, but I, but you, we, I don't have much time we have before you, you know, you had to go back into court, but we're going to play, mix it up a little bit. I want to finish the gun piece a little bit, a, a little bit later, but on the motive piece, on the, because we basically see this case, or at least I do, as the ballistics, which I think fell apart right there in that clip, as well as the motive in the case, and, and the prosecutor continually hounding on, the, you know, this whole thing about Tex MacGyver and the money and the will. How is the jury responding to this? He's very, uh, sounds like a preacher, if you will. He's out there pounding his fist and, uh, and, and working up a sweat. Um, is the jury, like, buying this, or, or do you think that they're looking at this like, hey, people have financial motives, but the prosecution never attached the financial motive to anything prior to the incident that actually showed that they were angry, mad, or dissatisfied with one another over it? Yeah, I think that's just it. I think, you know, Mr. Rucker lost the jury during his closing statements as soon as he opened up about the octopus and, you know, spewing out ink. You know, you could just tell on their face they weren't as interested from that point. And he did go back to the financial motive. He did go back to that. But, I mean, I've been married twice. Yes, money is a factor when you're involved in a marriage, but that does not make a murderer. And I think the defense did an excellent role in debunking all of that. When Mr. Samuel talked about why would he shoot her through a seat that has metal, that there's no chance that there's no guarantee the bullet would have gone through and struck Diane. Like he said, why not shoot her in the head? More importantly, why do it in front of a witness, but not only a witness, 
her very best friend. It just doesn't make sense. You, you, you know what? I think that those defense lawyers were listening to the Law and Crime Network because these were the exact arguments that many of us were making throughout. So I'm curious because you were there and, and we got you an opportunity to see a person right there feeling that courtroom, the sweat, the heat, the, the jurors' reactions, most importantly. When they were making that argument, like, is this the kind of thing you would do to commit a murder with another witness in the vehicle and through a seat where you feasibly could only have one round with all sorts of things that are in the seat? We're seeing a picture of it right now. Was the jury resonating with that in any way you could tell? Yeah, I, honestly, I don't, I don't think they were buying it. Mr. Samuel brought up the point about the plastic bag. You know, Mr. Rucker brought it up to say it was an attempt to hide the GSR, but this has never been a who done it. Texas never said I didn't shoot my wife. So I think when Mr. Samuel was talking about this plastic bag and that the fact that he wrapped it in there because there were break-ins, I think the jury was buying into that because to his point, wrapping the gun in a plastic bag wouldn't have made any difference. The fact is from day one, Tex McGyver said he shot his wife. That has not been an argument. He didn't blame it on someone else. So, you know, to say that was part to conceal the crime doesn't make sense because he never tried to conceal the crime. Well, let me ask you this question, too. It's a little bit more complex probably to see from a juror's face, but uh, there is all of this discussion about the multiple statements that Tex MacGyver, you know, had given, even though they've been disputed, the nurses had two different stories. Are, are you sensing that a jury may be seeing here that, hey, it's a guy that was involved in a bad thing, he's a high-profile person, there's going to be a lot of media attention, and that he may have been lying, massaging, or manipulating the truth for that reason, that's why he got a publicist, as opposed to the fact that that's proof of murder? you get any sense about that? I mean, that's how I see it personally. I mean, if I was in Texas shoes, again, I've been married twice. If my wife, my ex-wife, ended up shot while we were both in the vehicle, I'm going to say, yeah, this doesn't look good. Anyone in that situation likely would say, yes, this doesn't look good. And yes, maybe you should say you weren't here. But the fact still remains, he never said he did not kill his wife. He never said he didn't shoot his wife. So I don't see where you can say there's premeditation. I don't say where you can say this was perfectly planned to get this money when no one is disputing that. And the defense made a good point today. Like there could have been hundreds of other places this could have gone down, but yet it happened inside a vehicle with a witness. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah, Vincent Hill, our, our law enforcement analysis analyst, is, is right there in the courtroom feeling it out. I think that's an amazing analysis and that perspective and how the jury's responding to it. I mean, we're always looking at the corner of our eye about how the jury's seeing everything we do, because in the end, it's about what the jury thinks that's important. And when the prosecution has the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt, which is to a moral certainty, each and every element of each offense to 12 jurors, I can tell you personally, you better have some pretty darn good evidence going in there and a good presentation. But let's go to Linda Bodden for a minute. And let me let me ask, because this is a, a, an expert not only in the law. This is a person who actually has been involved in a case where the same kind of mishap occurred. Tell, tell yeah, us about that. Yeah, when our team was trying Jason Williams' case, the former Nets basketball player, and he was, uh, you know, very high, it was a very high-profile case, there was an issue, and our, our team argued that this was an accident, that the gun went off. This was, an, if you recall, this was a shotgun, and that the hammer and sear was so, t so tight on one another and small that any type of movement would have caused the gun to go off. And guess what happened when law enforcement expert had it? When the state police ha was testifying, the gun went off in the courtroom. The trigger moved. They put the gun down and the trigger moved. And everyone was like, whoa. And I'm outside the courtroom texting in. I'm like, guys, did you just see that? You got to make a point about it. The gun just went off. So it happens. What people don't realize when these guns are tested, what's reported back to the defense and to the prosecution is the average of, of like the testing of, of how many pounds and all. But not every single incident of the testing. So we don't even know whether this gun went off when they were testing it uh, for this case, because that may not have been reported. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a, that's a great insight. Hey, uh, hey, Vincent Hill, I don't know if we still have you, but if we do in a three-shot, it'd be great. Uh, let's, go, let's go to this. Um, I, I found this compelling. I'm, I'm interested to see what you think of it. Let's face this case. 
If this financial motive is so important, if it was such consternation, if there was such a, a hard time that these two people were having, here is what the prosecutor said pretty close to a quote in addressing it. And I noticed, by the way, Linda Bodden, he went in and out of it as fast as he could. Lickety split. Here's, here's the quote. Of course she said it was an accident because she couldn't imagine he would do it. And I'm thinking to myself when he's saying that, well, if this was such a bad financial thing and this will was such an issue, then of course you'd be saying, I know why he did it. He did it because of all those things. How did that look in front of the jury? You, you hit it spot on. I mean, I thought the exact same thing. If it was a financial motive, then her best friend would have known about it. And, you know, I watched the jury, and quite frankly, when Mr. Rucker was talking, there were a lot of jurors that were just kind of, yawning one female kept playing with her hair as if she wasn't interested right it was just kind of like uh, we've heard this for seven weeks now it was about the money it was about the money but to that point if diane was as close to danny joe carter as they say then diane danny joe would have come to court and said yes she talked to me about text and this money and the prosecution presented emails about money however those emails were from 2005, 2006, 2007, we're in 2018. The murder happened over a year ago. Is that really relevant to what happened inside that vehicle at 10 p.m. on a Sunday night? Hey, Vincent Hill, Linda Bodden, let me ask you this question. Based upon your guys' extensive experience, I like to think that I got some extensive experience, too. I can tell you it's never happened with me. Has it happened with you that someone who is plotting to do a murder tries to do it in front of somebody's friend driving a vehicle with a gun in the front seat, bringing it into the back seat, fires it off, and then takes the person to the hospital. Have you ever had anything similar to that? Or do you find that most people try to do it to make it look like the other person either committed suicide or somebody else killed them? What's your experience? I'll start off with Linda. What's your experience? Let me think about that for a second. Okay, I thought about it. No! Zero. I don't funny feel you said that. How about you, Vincent? <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to go right back to the same thing. Let me think. Mm, no. And I, I've arrested a lot of people for attempted murder for murder. I've charged people with that. It's never happened. There's always been, I don't want someone to know about it because as the saying goes, snitches get stitches, right? So why would you want someone there that could tell that story? You absolutely wouldn't. Yeah. Hey, listen, you know, being a, a law enforcement analyst and a former uh, law enforcement officer, one of the most capable, uh, skilled persons I ever worked with was my captain of investigations when I was the county prosecutor. Um, this guy could get a statement out of anybody. And I'm talking about lawyers and doctors and police officers. He had a great way about him. Uh, he was really an amazing guy. And, and he used to often say when he would give his classes, and I agree, there's not much difference between a guy like you, Vincent, and people like us lawyers. When we're in there doing cross-examination, it's very much like an interview that cops do when they're when they're putting an investigation together but he always used to say people lie for all sorts of reasons when they're giving a statement and it doesn't necessarily mean that they're guilty of the crime they may lie because of infidelity a gambling problem a drug addiction or it just doesn't look good what's your experience Vincent no you're absolutely right I mean I've had people lie to me for the dumbest reasons when I'm taking them to jail like why did you lie to me that. about this it's kind of silly but people lie just because they want to cover up something else they don't want you to find out about this but lying in itself does not make you a killer it doesn't make you a murderer it doesn't suggest that you plan this you know, horrendous plot as the prosecution is claiming that he did. Just one quick question before we go to a clip that I think that the, the folks will want to see. Um, do you believe the jury is kind of seeing that based upon these contradictory statements? I know it's difficult to get into the jury's minds. God knows we'd all love to. But do you think that that's coming across, that that is the reason as opposed to evidence of guilt of murder? Yeah, I, I think based on their expression, the whole back and forth and the, the, the entire motive of why Tex would have done this is becoming clear, at least to me. Again, I don't want to speculate what they're thinking, but I, I think the defense played a much uh, more smart role in their closing arguments because they stayed with evidence. They stayed with facts. The prosecution, mind you, was very theatrical and it played on emotion. 
there was one point you probably saw where they put up this huge picture of uh, Diane, right? And at the very end, one of the slides, and I assume it came across on screen, was Diane laying on the hospital bed deceased. And I listened to the, not the jury, but I listened to people in the courtroom and they're just like, oh my God. You know, so the prosecution wanted to play on emotion. The defense wants to play on evidence. Now, of course, the jury usually goes with who tells the better story, but you can't ignore the evidence. You can't ignore the facts of this case. Well, I'll tell you what's amazing about that before we get to this clip is that typically, uh, like a lot of things in the case, that's the reverse. The prosecution typically wants to be arguing evidence and facts. And like they say, Linda Bottom, I'm going to give you the last word before we throw to the clip. You know, they always say, if, if you've got the facts, uh, if you don't have the facts, argue the law. And if you don't have the law, argue the facts. And when you don't have the facts or the law, just pound your fist. And that's pretty much the bottom what we're seeing here. Don't you agree? Uh, I agree. I don't think the prosecution has proved their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's where we're at now. They may have proved involuntary manslaughter, but that's another issue we don't know we're going to talk about. Well, before we're going to get back to that involuntary manslaughter. I don't know if you'll be with us, Vincent, but uh, thank you for being inside that courtroom. And we're going to talk a little bit about some very another flip-flop in this case. The prosecution, get ready, folks, here's the teaser. The prosecution asking the jury not to check off the box that says involuntary manslaughter. I say it's a mistake. We'll get back to that. Thank you, Linda, Vincent, you. awesome. Now let's hit some clips and we'll talk, uh, talk to you shortly on the other end, folks. Wow, we're back here at the Law and Crime Network after having done this amazing trial of Tex MacGyver. Um, and we're in the closings, and we're, we're just going at it with Linda Bodden here. Uh, and Vincent Hill is our law and analyst uh, out there right inside the courtroom who's able to give us a firsthand perspective about how the nuances are going on. Hopefully do a three-screen with Vincent and uh, be able to ask him a couple more That's questions. Great. But one of the things, Vincent, that as a trial lawyer I've always told my people that I've trained is that you have to be perceptive of Everything that's going on in that courtroom, you have to have eyes in the back of your head, if you will, because every little nuance matters. You need to own the courtroom. You need to be confident in the courtroom. So I'm just curious, as far as the lawyering is concerned, who seems like they're that person that's just really in control, isn't uncomfortable, is confident, and is hitting all the high notes? Who is that in your mind? No doubt in my mind is Mr. Samuel. I mean, I watched the jury when he was up giving his closing arguments and they would smile. They would laugh at some of the things he said. You know, you didn't get that when the prosecution was up. So I would say without a doubt, it's Mr. Samuel. And he is in tune with that jury. He's in tune with what they want to hear based on the evidence of this case, not based on octopuses, not based on glass mason jars, not based on wiping your, your sweat with your handkerchief. They want to hear the facts of this case, and Mr. Samuel, without a doubt, presented that to the jury during these closing arguments. You, you, you know, I, I, I know that we love these little anecdotal stories. I was actually doing a defense case. I, I do defense work as well, and I remember saying to the jury uh, going at it, and I was doing it basically the way I am now, very passionate, Linda, and I, I said to them something that this is not the way something goes down in the city of Newark, and I had a juror get up and stand up and say, amen. I know, I know. And you, you I look know. at that, and you're like, wow, man, I know that I'm, I'm doing something. I'm rocking something here, because jurors are normally not that emotive, and I think that they specifically try not to be. What's been your experience? Well, they try not to be, except when they get bored and tired and start blaming, in, my, in some cases, like the prosecution. The last case we tried with Aaron Hernandez, blaming the prosecution for being there for a long time. And so you have to be aware when jurors get tired that they may stop being with you, but you also have to be aware when they're, they're responding to you. And you can feel it as a trial lawyer. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to vote in your way, but they're responding to you. And so you, if a trained trial lawyer should know that, and you should always be aware of that jury, Bob. Always. Yeah, I, I, and you know, being entertaining without being clownish, which I think, with all due respect, uh, the fish thing, the octopus thing, and the glass jar is, um, is is very, very important. But I want to go to that last, the, the last clip, and just go back a little bit. I think that the defense lawyer hit something that, since I've been on the Law and Crime Network, I've been saying from the beginning, motive only makes sense. If the motive is such that it would cause a reasonable person to kill another person. And that defense lawyer, I believe, did a very, very good job. And I'm going to throw this first to you, Linda. Mm -hmm. Did a really good job at indicating, listen, 
I mean, they loved each other. Everyone said they had a great relationship. And they're planning on or played golf that day, whatever the scenario was. Are these the actions of a person who is contemplating going and later murdering his wife and that this financial motive doesn't make sense because they had a loving relationship? How effective do you think that was, Linda, in terms of convincing the jury that the most important, secondary important piece in this case, the motive, is not there? Okay, so on a scale of zero to to 10, I vote for zero effectiveness. And the reason why I say this is they turned everything that's supposed to be good in a marriage to being bad. Oh, Tex had Diane on, on uh, Tex had his wife on his arm and he was showing her off. And somehow that was bad because he wanted her for her power and her wealth. That's a good thing when you want to show off your spouse. That's wonderful. So remember we talked about credibility? The lawyer has to have credibility in their arguments. And these arguments are not credible. And what do you think about that, Vincent? I mean, when, when he was actually saying, uh, I, I could see this being something where people would nod their head that prior to all of this, there was never any indication that there was acrimony to a level that is beyond that of any marriage that you may have, and certainly not to the level that would cause one to kill. What were they looking like when, you, when that argument was being made? Yeah, I, I think it's sunk in and, and to, you know, Mr. Samuel's point, you know, he went golfing that day. They went to a restaurant. They were out drinking with a friend, of course, with witnesses, of course. Is that in line with someone who's planning a murder? Think about this. How many people are in prison right now that were married to someone and they hired, say, a hit man or someone to make it look like a robbery? Wouldn't it have made more sense for text to go out and do something like this. Let's hire someone to make it appear as this, especially if you have a witness in the car, because Danny Joe would have been none the wiser to what was going on. But that didn't happen here. From day one, Texas said, I shot my wife accidentally. Here's how it happened. Here's why it happened. So I think that's going to resonate with the jury when this goes into the deliberation. Okay, listen, let's go into the next thing. We're going to throw a clip about this in, in a minute. But we need to talk about law here. I mean, it is the Law and Crime Network. Um, and so the law is very, very crucial here, as we all know, because the jury gets charged not based upon what people feel the law is or think the law is, but on the exact law. And my experience has been, and before I get to the question, uh, Linda, I want to ask, like, my experience has been the jurors typically follow the judges uh, descriptions of the law, especially a judge like this who seems to me, Vincent, let me just throw it to you real quick, it seems to me the jury responds very positively to this judge. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. They kind of have a personal relationship, if you will, with this judge. Like, he explains everything to the T. He answers their questions. He makes them feel important in this case. So I think they have this quote unquote, personal relationship with this judge and they trust his word. Yeah, that's why, by the way, folks, as a lawyer, you never want to get on the bad side of a judge that's like that with a jury. I actually had it happen to me once because, you know, if the judge starts spanking you in front of that jury, the jury looks at it and says, you must be doing something wrong because the judge, you know, doesn't like you, but even if you're doing something right. But uh, let's go to, the, before we get to the clip, let's go to the idea that there are varying levels of charges here that the judge is going to allow. The most important, in my mind, for this case are going to be whether it's going to be a murder conviction, the highest charge, or whether it could be involuntary manslaughter. Now, the prosecution did something. There's, there's things called lesser included offenses. We've discussed this on the Law and Crime Network before. The, the prosecution against the prosecution got these lesser included offenses. In other words, it is a Chinese menu of options. The jury is being able to be given about whether it was murder or whether it was reckless conduct and, and uh, manslaughter or involuntary manslaughter, which is negligent conduct. It may sound all confusing, but trust me, the judge will read those definitions. And trust me, after the judge reads those definitions, it'll be just as confusing as it was before he read those definitions. In essence, I found they just lob it up to the jury to make a call. But those lesser included offenses are meant to be able to give a, a, the option for the jury to come back with something less than the higher charge. It's usually there to protect the defense. 
Uh, Linda Bodden, what do you think about the lesser included offenses in this case? Well, here, here's the issue. The involuntary manslaughter would be normally where you want to go, but the prosecution tell the jury, do not check that box. So that's normally where, where you'd want to go on this case if you were a jury, that it was an accident. The defense now put the sleep expert to try to negate that, to give the jury a handle to say it, was more, it wasn't involuntary manslaughter. It's true, true accident. It doesn't even qualify as a crime. The more danger thing, though, Bob, that I found for the, for the defense, here's the danger. I don't think this felony murder charge should have been in there. That's if you commit an aggravated assault. You, sh you said if you shoot somebody, then all of a sudden it becomes murder by the way that you shot somebody. She reckless, she died because you were reckless in your conduct, and therefore it's murder. That's the danger here for the defense. And that really, in my opinion, really shouldn't be a felony murder, but it's there. Okay, so listen, let's go to the spot where the prosecutor is talking about involuntary manslaughter, and we're going to throw it back to our guests, because I think it was a fascinating flip-flop from what you normally see the way this case or those charges are presented right. in most trials. Okie doke, you are listening to the prosecutor give some contradictory, in my opinion, explanations of what to do with the charge. But before we get to Linda Bodden again, I know Vincent Hill, our legal analyst that's right there in the courtroom, you got to run back there, and I know so that you can report back to us with these amazing instances. So I just got one question to, for you. It comes from uh, one of our bloggers out here, and I've, I'm trying folks online to, to look as best I can, but I'm doing a lot here. It's from Funfair who asks, and I think that this is, uh, is an important question, what, what did the jury or how did it feel to you when the prosecutor referred to the victim as a little girl? Yeah, you know, for me personally, it was like, but she's not a little girl. She was a grown woman at this point. And, you know, it goes back to the whole theatrical thing that the prosecution was trying to do here in the courtroom, uh, you know, to say, Diane, who's going to protect this little girl? Diane was a grown woman. She was a wife. She died tragically. And, you know, I think it, it was an attempt to play on the emotion of the jury, but I don't think it got over too well. And, and don't you think that it actually, once again, contradicts their own theory of the case? The theory of the case is that she's a sophisticated businesswoman, that she had her thumb on this Tex MacGyver who's an attorney, and that uh, she was sometimes surly and nasty and uh, directing him what to do and not do. And then they call him, and the next thing, this poor little girl uh, just doesn't make any sense. Is that the way you see it? Yeah, absolutely. It contradicts everything that they tried to build Diane up to be. And, you know, it just this reminds me of a very famous case that happened a few years ago. Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman, the jury kept asking the charging order for manslaughter. But the defense, I mean, the prosecution kept saying, no, it's murder. It's murder. They could not improve. They could not prove that intent. They could not prove that malice. And guess what? George Zimmerman got off here. So for the prosecution to say, don't check the box for involuntary manslaughter, it may come back to haunt them later. Okay, Vincent Hill, our, our analyst, that's right there in the courtroom. And thank you for your time. We know you got to run back. And I'm going to turn it over now back to myself and, and Linda. And we're going to actually talk that very last point. We're going to pick up from what you just said. Thank you very much, Vincent Hill. Thanks, Bob. You got it. Okay, listen, Linda, I, I, this is something that, that going back to kind of like the end of what Vincent was saying and what we heard in that clip, you know, there's an expression, you can't eat your cake and have it too. Now, here she is saying, don't check the box for involuntary manslaughter, but then says he's guilty of all offenses, which one of which is involuntary manslaughter. I know it's picky you, Bob. You're being picky you. It's just sloppy. And when it's sloppy like that, again, you lose credibility with the jury as to you know what you're even doing. But let's get to that. Don't check off involuntary manslaughter. And kind of like what Vincent was saying, what are your thoughts about what the prosecution is doing here? Well, cueing off what Vincent was saying, because I love to listen to people in the courtroom, because they have a better handle of what the jury's feeling. But the prosecution just wants the top, they want the top counts. And they, they're not, they don't want that involuntary manslaughter. So they're telling the jury, no, I'm not taking that. Now, usually, Bob, you hear that from a defense point of view. If there's a charge of murder, for instance, the defense doesn't want the lesser included because they don't think the prosecution has proven the case of murder. I've never heard a prosecutor say, don't check this box. You can start out by saying, look, 
we charge at the very least is involuntary manslaughter. It involves a gun. He was careless with it. He was reckless with it. We think he's reckless. And he killed his wife. And therefore, it has to at least be this. But we think it's more. And let us tell you why it's more. Here they're saying, we bought a charge that we don't believe in. That in itself is wrong. And, and how about this? L Linda, the case originally was charged as a manslaughter That's case. Right. And then all of a sudden, because of this financial motive, which in my opinion is falling apart, you're saying it's not, it's murder. Now, le let me tell you what I would have done if this was one of my assistant prosecutors when oh, I was the boss. I think that there would be no, a trouble. Actually, no. We had a lot of fun with one another. But when you got a job to do like this and people's lives are on the line, you need to be good, skilled, precise, and you got to learn. Like people taught me, I teach them. Here's what you do. You sit there and you say, there is no question, ladies and gentlemen, that this is an involuntary manslaughter conviction because you don't want the jury to pick between murder and not guilty. That's the reason you have lesser included offenses. I agree. It typically helps the defense. But here the prosecution is removing themselves from that. So you sit there and you say, there's no doubt about that. But let me tell you why it's murder in this case and not involuntary manslaughter. This way you're not throwing the involuntary manslaughter charge away right. and leaving the jury between a rock and a hard place. Because my experience has been, and I'm interested in your opinion about this, Linda, when you leave a jury on a kind of wobbly case between murder and not guilty, you may get a not guilty or a hung jury. What are your thoughts? Absolutely. You're absolutely right because they want to have a lot of choices. And they want to, don't want to feel pegged that they have to vote for murder here when they think it's something less than murder. So they may end up getting a not guilty unless there's something else that goes on again with this funny felony murder charge. Now, we should be clear. An involuntary manslaughter is nothing more than negligence, right? It's criminal negligence. In some states, you do not have that. The state where we practice for all, for instance, there's no criminal negligent homicide generally. Right. For years there's right. not, unless it involved an automobile. So, but here there is. And what more What more do you have to prove that a gun went off? I mean, this gun went off. I well, mean, he handled it. That's he a, somebody. That's a great, you know, great rhetorical question. And, and when you go to law school, it's the Socratic me method of teaching. It's not about the answers. It's about knowing how to ask the right questions. And you asked a great one. We were talking about this offset. It's my opinion, and we'll only know afterwards if That's the defense right. tries to yeah. talk about it. But I think the sleep expert, which they didn't really need on the murder charge, in my opinion, folks, tell me what you think about this online. I think they did that to say that he had, it's not reckless, That's and right. it wasn't negligent. Right. It was a mere accident. He was startled and he woke up because even with recklessness and negligence, you still have to have some level right. of a mental thing that causes you to do a certain thing, even though you may not have intended death. Does that make sense it to you? It makes sense, especially when the rest of the prosecution case is so iffy and so iffy and so iffy. So you want to give the jury something to hold their hat on, something to argue that it's not even negligence here. It's, it's it's more like when I spilled this coffee on you, Bob, I can do it again. I knew this coffee in this cup, right? I, I, I knew it was hot. I still picked it up and it still kind of spilled. I didn't intend it to spill. Was it negligence? Possibly. But, but was I trying to prove a point so maybe it's forgiven? Too. That's and a great, me. you know, lot, that's a great, we're going to take our prop here on the Law and Crime Network. And, and uh, the cleanup and, of the and, prop. And, 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 and you bring up a good point. And you know what, this was something that would have been a great demonstrable thing in the courtroom. If it, if it hasn't come out, maybe it, it maybe it did. Uh, that example of that you negligently spilled the coffee is one thing. But how many of us have gone through a scenario where we've been asleep and holding a drink mm -hmm. in our hands or whatever <laughs> and get startled and we spill it? In There's the a big difference between you having the cup and, and not handling it properly and then it just acts Accidentally, due to a somatic response, as they would say, an uncontrollable physical response you have. And I think that that is why the defense put on the sleep expert to say that it wasn't just that he had it and didn't maintain it properly, hence negligence or recklessness, but rather was startled and therefore would be a not guilty outright that's if right. the jury believes it. That's right. And that's why when the prosecution then put on the other expert to say, well, it's my opinion that he couldn't have done it. Well, well so what? That's your opinion. He couldn't have done it. We've given, we're the jury. We've been sitting here. We've shown that indeed he could have fallen asleep. He could have woken up. And how many of us have woken up for like being asleep for like 10 seconds, you know, probably Probably when I was watching the, the prosecution here, I was doing that a little bit, nodding away. And you go, oh, what day is it? Where am I? Did I miss my... It happens. It happens. Okay, great. Listen, you know, we need to talk about felony murder. You were bringing that yes. up before. And we, I want to show a little clip about what was going on with the prosecution and how they were handling... Uh, this is a really complex area, this felony murder. So let's see what they did in court, and we'll be right back with you guys. Nice to her. 
Okay, well, there you got it, a, a replay on, on felony murder. And you're going to be hearing a lot more about the jury charge and going forward. I have some sad news to present to you. One of the greatest days I've had, host on Law and Crime Network with Linda Bodden, who is a, a real pro, is coming to a close end. Uh, I have one announcement to make. I want to thank you guys for, uh, again, all your support and all the great comments that were online that I was able to take a look at. But I am told as my last comment to you, that you can go to, believe it or not, the Law and Crime Network Twitter and actually vote whether or not you think this case is going to be a murder, an involuntary manslaughter, or a not guilty. And I'm going to go on the line like I do with every single case, Linda Bodden, yes. and I'm going to tell you that I will make a prediction. It's at least a hung jury if I'm not guilty. And if I'm wrong, that I will come back on this network and I will have to eat crow. And I'll have to spill my coffee on you again. It's been so such a pleasure, It's Bob. been a thank pleasure, you. and thank all of you who are watching the Law and Crime Network. We're going to go to another feed, and we'll be back uh, shortly with another host and uh, some more uh, guests. Thank you.